My name is Mark Sargent, and this is a cast member commentary for Behind the Curve, the movie. And we're going to try to do this in one shot, one take, because I haven't watched it in a while, I mean, a few years at least. Uh, we shot this back in 2017, and right now it's 2024, so let's get to it. The movie starts right about now. So it's from Delta V Productions. That's Daniel Clark and his team. And the opening scene, which is one of the first things we did on day one, is Useless Bay Beach off of Whidbey Island. That is me facing Sunlight Beach where I grew up. So I, I fished and I windsurfed out there. You know, we, they had me kind of looking around. But, but I didn't get a lot of direction from him on the first day. We had just met that day. So where are you? And so I opened up at the line, you know, where are we? And they cut away to these graphics, which was, of course, uh, original graphics by them. The Earth spinning on its axis and the Earth not visible going around the sun. The sun flying through the solar system at a very high rate of speed. And then this is them kind of simulating the, the Milky Way galaxy best they could do. It was a, it was a fairly low budget production, which is totally fine. They come back to me. This is, by the way, one of the, the shirts that were sent to me. I didn't design any of the shirts. People just kept sending me shirts. This was the Flat Earth Army shirt, and I'm also wearing a Canadian hat. You probably can't tell from that shot, but we were, I, I lived in Canada for a year. Anyway, they did the pullback from Whidbey Island. There's Washington and the West Coast of the United States and the whole United States, and of course, the Earth with the oversized sun and moon. That's not how we do it. And of course, they immediately go to the, uh, the the moon footage, you know, all the the black and white, and some some of it's going to be color from the Apollo programs in Gemini. There's Delta V again. Look up Delta V. That is part of the whole space thing. Uh, the fact that they called it that. You know, some some quick editing, and there it is behind the curve. And there's the curved Earth, showing some YouTube searches. There's Darren Nesbitt, one of our guys from England. And uh, music by Brian Ricker, who I never met. Google Flat Earth, it was carved on the side of a hill in um, Los Angeles. There's Dell. Space Shuttle. Super fun. Uh, this is kind of a quick compilation of how it got so popular on social media and how social media kind of propelled Flat Earth into the next level. Uh, more quick editing of moonshots. Yep, produced by Nick and Daniel. They had to pick up other producers later. Caroline Clark, who I got to meet a number of times. Love the editing they did on this. I thought Nick did a fantastic job. Of course, directed by Daniel J. Clark, who hated us. It seemed like a fun project at the beginning, but man, he did not like us very much. All right, then we cut to Whidbey Island. That is a ferry shot, and they're, they're mixing some ferry shots. This is the shot looking coming from Muckleteo into Clinton, Washington. Uh, the first shot was going the other way. Uh, B-roll is rarely uh, in sequence. So there's the Clinton ferry dock. That's a shot of my mom coming out of my sister's house. I got a lot of trouble for that because my sister was not home when she shot this. There's my mom in a completely different house uh, on the golf course, at her condo at the golf course, and uh, I am there with her. She is uh, making some stew. We made this actually for everybody. Uh, I think Daniel and Caroline ate with us that day. Yep, Patty Sargent, Mark's mom, who's still alive right now. She's uh, just turned 81. It's me wearing a completely different hat and wearing a different shirt, the I am Mark Sargent shirt, which we'll see later, which I had nothing to do with. There's mom with her Seattle Seahawks shirt. And we are shooting this shot in front of some of my sister's roses, which you'll see later. Uh, that's me, my room. That was my early stuff. I was using a, an Alienware R4, which was kind of fun. That's upstairs in my mom's house. That is one of Chris Pontius's first models that he made of the flat earth. With, uh, it was literally the top. The dome was made out of a cake plate, uh, a cake dome. Because that's what had that little handle, that little ball on the top there. Which eventually he had to fabricate his own domes because he, it was almost impossible to find domes. Uh, shot of Jim Carrey from the Truman Show. 
which was such an inspiring movie. You know, what, how much, what could you fool? How could you fool the American people with the Truman Show? I think it was Jim Carrey's best work, honestly. Uh, I know that other people would, would say some of his other stuff, but I think the Truman Show was, was his high watermark. This is the Useless Bay exclusive access beach. And by the way, that, so that's part of the country club. And Daniel didn't want to shoot that. That's Seattle off in the distance and uh, off behind those hills. And those hills are Whidbey Island. I was trying to make the point that if those hills weren't there, you'd be able to see most of Seattle, even though it's 30-something miles away. And I just grabbed a random stick and started talking about the curvature of the earth and how you shouldn't be able to see one point to the other. So there's us, and there would be Seattle, and you, you should not be able to see it. And some people say refraction. It's like, well, refraction only goes so far. And again, what you're shooting, what the, the hills you're seeing in the distance there, those aren't right next to Seattle. That is part of Whidbey Island. And we should, again, you never know because you don't do multiple takes in a documentary. Oh, uh, there's Neil Tyson going on Comedy Central. And that was, that, I think that was a mistake on their part because he didn't show, he didn't bring his A game. You know, he didn't show any graphics or list any text on the screen. It was just him talking for like six or seven minutes. And eventually he drops the mic and does, oh, this is gravity, right? Yeah, yeah. very, very cool. So he became our, our number one target, which was great. He ended up putting a target on his own back. So there's me doing close-up shots. Again, useless Bay Beach. There's Double Bluff in the background. That model hanging on the wall behind us or behind me was, uh, that was a Chris Pontius model. That's, this is them doing a graphic interpretation of me telling the story of, of how Flat Earth is the worst conspiracy book on the shelf. In fact, there are no real, they weren't at the time, any Flat Earth conspiracy books. It was all, I, I never even looked, Area 1, 51, the Rothschilds, the moon landing. Nice little graphic re representation of me. Makes me look like I have a pig nose. I, it's fine. I never thought that. Mom and I talking. Mom, by the way, they were so they were so grateful that mom signed the waiver. By the way, so we shot in front of my sister's roses, and my sister was a Tom at a Tom Petty concert, and when she came, we didn't tell her, and because we didn't think the movie was going to come out, it was actually going to be released. And when it did, uh, my sister got so mad. She was so angry. There's Matt Boyland, the man, the legend, uh, you know, Canadian comedian slash actor slash painter from Montreal, Canada, who went to Hollywood. Uh, and then there's, there's me. I love the fact that they used me doing the narration of Matt's story because I could tell it better. Because so Matt was at a NASA party. Of course, he was younger then. He was in his 20s, and that's the wonderful video they did. The only great good video I ever saw him do, and he was sober. He sat down. He talked about how he was at that NASA party and uh, how that there were people there talking about how the Earth was flat, which is awesome. I wish I had kept. By the way, I gave that that model right there to to somebody. That's worth something because Chris hasn't been making models for a while since he moved to Oklahoma. So all that stuff's worth. Uh, Alex Ross framed stuff on the wall. Uh, m there's me. Oh yeah, talking about the La Brea Tar Pits reference. I didn't even catch that the first time or the second time. And uh, I thought their animation would actually, considering their budget was pretty good. Yeah, the Jerry Maguire moment, 3.30 in the morning. And of course, I caught hell for that because it was 33. Any, anytime you use the, the number 33 in the conspiracy world, we catch a lot of hell for it. Um, uh, me doing experiments, me doing video editing for the first time. Me connecting the dots, and I know I love how the. By the way, things I just noticed now, how they put me way out in the corner. Yep, the very first flat Earth clues, which was just me grabbing a whole bunch of images off of Google and attaching them to a narration which I wrote. So yeah, it was it was. I, again, never thought in a million years that it would resonate the way that it did. Nobody does. That's why producers 90% of the time uh, say no for a living. Flat, flat World Champions, by the way, that was a Kyrie Irving shirt, which was, in fact, I think his, his guys made that, which was when he, w when he won the world title for the NBA in 2017, he became, you know, he became a flat earther, and then, uh, so that's, that's their champion shirt. That was kind of fun. Uh, Flat Earth part, Clues Part 7, The Long Haul, using a couple of graphics from there. I grabbed any graphics I could. I did not know anything about copyright, or, and I was so lucky. I only got hit for like two images out of all the images I used. I only got hit for like two of them. 
and they just made me pay. I think they ended up making me pay the, the people that own those images, I think like $40, which was awesome. So the Flat Earth Clues were basically made for nothing, for free. I just went out and grabbed every any image that, that caught my eye. Uh, I've got my, my family's, you know, my sister is a decent photographer, my mother is a decent photographer, and uh, I, I don't I don't photograph myself, but at the same time I got an eye for some images. So, and there's talking about the comments, 99% of the comments I do not read, one for obvious reasons, because there's way too many of them, and the other is because uh, all it takes is one or two negative comments, and you, you dwell on those, and... Those my early interviews that I did uh, with with people. Uh, at this point, this stage, I think I've done. I know I've done between 500 and 600. I don't know because because of copyright things. There's only so many interviews I can put on my channel, and there's international stuff which I like people that never send to me. Producers don't send stuff to me all the time. So there's got to be like a hundred interviews out there that I know. That's me walking through Langley, Washington. By the way, look that up. Langley, Washington. That's a seaside town. That's kind of fun. Uh, this is them interviewing one of our one of our guys. They had, they had to find scientists, and they found this young girl at the California Institute of uh, Technology, Hanalore. And this is clever editing because you know she, I, she didn't watch all the clues. And there's a nice globe in the background, very well done there. And you know they the reason why the the movie did as well as it did is because they the producers did not like flat earth no flat earth was were involved in the direct making of the film yeah i probably could have been a silent producer but they weren't going to list me as that not even close they they wouldn't didn't even consider it even though i was the one that roped all the the, the main cast members together uh because they didn't want that image uh, they didn't want to portray themselves and they were right which was just about every film festival they were tied to uh that was the first question they asked was, are you guys flat earthers? When they asked the producers. Now she's pointing, by the way, at some of the, the, the planes. And what again, they didn't let her watch the rest of the clues, which was the latitude and longitude of that plane when you get off there are approximated or estimated. So yeah, the plane shows up as a graphic, but it's only estimated to know where it is. Um, I think I met this guy, uh, Spiros. I think I met him when I was down um, in California briefly. I can't remember that, though, to be sure. And, of course, Scott Kelly. Okay, the astronaut. I love the fact that they, they brought him in there because, one, the, the little producers behind this, they were so amazed that they got him, that the NASA said yes. But when they brought him into the studio, they had him for almost exactly 10 minutes. And it was almost like they, they, you know he knew exactly what he was going to say when he got in there. And the line he used was, uh, the first time I knew about Flat Earth was when I was in space. That is the most brilliant canned answer ever. And he ended up, uh, that ended up being used in the trailer, and it got a big laugh uh, in the studio audiences. Um, Tim Urban doing his thing. And again, science, the, everybody here, and I've, I've said this many, many times, which is if you have a master's degree in any sort of physical science, uh, it doesn't even have to be a physical science, but a physical science really helps. You are going to hate us. Hate us. It's just how outrageous, how, how, how impossible. I mean, she's just shocked and appalled because if we were right, right, then her education would, all, all the money she spent would have been would have been worthless. That was Tim Osmond right there, ODD. Uh, Brian Mullen was earlier on, uh, which was interesting because Brian Mullen, which we'll talk about in the conference later, you know, he ended up pulling out of the conference because the structural engineers, the Society of Structural Engineers, did not want him co-sponsoring the the first flat earth concert conference but whenever I, I look at her it kills me and by the way her her reception with the audience remember i sat with the studio audiences which was different than just about everybody else in this movie um they they kind of chuckled at her mostly because of her hair color again people are shallow and so she lost credibility points just because of her hair color i don't care about hair color but at the same time the the studio audience did which I thought was interesting. That's that's us, by the way, sitting on a bench down in Langley, Washington. And that's uh, off in the bay there. That would be uh, Camino. That is, oh yeah, that's that's in California. This would be the the man, Nathan Thompson. And he's wearing a flat earth shirt, one of the Gleason's maps. And, oh man, Nathan, what do I say about Nathan? 
he was definitely the most entertaining. Uh, the studio audience was just riveted by, it's like, oh my God, he really is crazy, right? It's like, no, his mind is, is working at a million miles an hour. I couldn't have juggled uh, the ball in those hammers. He does mental exercises constantly. And when the Amazing Race came to us and they said they wanted to do a, uh, a show where it was just nothing but internet people for the Amazing Race, they definitely wanted Flat Earth. And I recommended Nathan Thompson and they ended up choosing him for this i said the, the man is built to be on a game show he would have been awesome and there were in fact it was he and it was, initially it was going to be myself and patricia and i said no no patricia is not meant for a game show you know she walks she leans she stands she glides but you need someone who's active someone that doesn't have an inner narrative because that's what it's all about when it comes to documentaries and, and reality television shows they want whatever's on your mind they want you sane they they, they want you hot mic'd at all times and that's what they did with Nathan. Uh, they, they were gonna they were gonna do that, but the internet, unfortunately, um, the the first reason why it all crashed and burned wasn't because of flat Earth. In fact, we were all in, absolutely all in. But every other internet group, you know, big internet groups, uh, you know, whatever, the Paul brothers and Shane Dawson and PewDiePie and those guys, they wouldn't do it without compensation. They said no, if we're, because you have to be off the internet for at least a month and usually like five weeks. I mean, like completely off the internet. You can't use email. You can't, you are, you are in a blackout zone. And not only that, but wherever, if you know anything about the Amazing Race, whatever city you get kicked out in, uh, you are then, you're locked into that city. You have to stay there in, in a blackout zone and can't talk to anybody until uh, the show's over, until they stop shooting for various production reasons. And nobody else in the internet would do that. We would do it. It was absolutely fine. Uh, I kind of wrote myself out of The Amazing Race because they they wanted me to watch all of season 31. And I watched it and I was like, oh, wow, the whole thing's scripted. Uh, the Amazing Race is nothing but a travel show in the, the disguise of a game show. It's in a game show wrapper. And, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, this, this part I, I always loved because Nathan was driving. And, again, the, the, the director was great on this. So he's, like, digging books out of his back seat trying to drive and drive to show the I mean Nathan knows where the camera is he's very camera savvy and at one point he just stops looking at the road now granted there, I don't think there's anybody in front of him but he's like he's like opening the book he's reading and you could tell I was with the audience and they were getting more and more nervous it's like wait he's not actually going to start reading this book and try to explain it to two of it's like yeah he was that's Nathan in his house why everything was painted um red and black I don't know anyway back to the amazing race story uh, they, I, I told them, I wrote the script for the whole season for, and sent it to The Amazing Race. I go, look, uh, first place gets a million dollars, of course. Second place gets 50000 Third place, they make it to the podium, so it's gold, silver, bronze. I said, make Flat Earth the bad guys. Make us the villain. That's me walking up uh, one of the streets in Langley, 4th Street in Langley. That's my uh, car right there uh, with the It's Flat license plate. Still have it. Still love it. I think it's, it's only got 60,000 miles on it right now. And it's, uh, it's first year, 2005 Chrysler 300C. Love that car. That's awesome. And that, that was my mom's old house, by the way, up in the corner. Uh, we were going through some of the license plates that people would send me, which was cool. Director caught this right away. It's flat, but everything's mixed up. It's an anagram. That's kind of fun. My early microphone. Uh, my early keyboard. I kept that keyboard for nine years. Couldn't believe it. It's uh, old school, hooking it up to an amp. Uh, I still, one of, one of the systems I still have uses an amp. Uh, the old school sound surround, which was, which was kind of fun. And that monitor, that monitor is still working today. That, that monitor was like eight years old when, when we were showing it here. I ended up giving it to my brother-in-law. That thing never wore out. It was this Dell, this really expensive Dell monitor. Um, I never did use, know how to use that paddle, paddle ball thing. I, that's so old school. I can't remember who I gave that away to. I gave away so much stuff. So much stuff. Uh, some of our fake flyers. Have you seen this kitty? Uh, me juggling globes. People send me stuff all the time and still send me stuff all the time. Flat Earth Watch. Oh, the stuff I gave away. That banner. Somebody uh, somebody got that during one of the meetups. I, I gave it that, that clock on the wall um, in the bathroom. I've still got that clock on the wall, which is awesome. That is a Flat Earth coffee table which I kept for a quite a while and then ended up giving to a, uh, a couple up in Oak Harbor, Washington. And they didn't even know what they were looking at. What was so fun was I gave them the whole table, you know, with the glass, and they had no idea what they were looking at when they were looking at it. It's like, oh, it's like, because, again, when you see a, a, a round blue thing, you think a globe. Oh, that's Bitsy the Cat. Bitsy the Cat, unfortunately, uh, is not with us anymore. It's been a few years anyway, but uh, she was picked off by a giant bald eagle off camera we, we never saw it 
it just happened. She was she was over in the corner of the yard, and the Patricia Steer with her cats, by the way. So we transitioned from cat to cat. So there's Patricia Steer in her house in Houston. Patricia Steer, the most camera ready person that any producer's ever seen for for a non actress. I've heard this from producers again and again, where it's like she only had to do like one screen test. She did her own professional makeup. Um, they painted her in a soft light. She was the only one in the movie that they just gave um, total. They 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 did not spin her in any direction. She was absolutely as is. She got a jukebox with the Smiths. She used to be uh, a DJ in California for years. Uh, she she has three cats right around her house at all times. Uh, they do not sleep with her because I and I made the mistake of sleeping in her guest room when I was when I was down there shooting this shot. Or not this particular part. Uh, when I when I was down there for the second shots, and uh, they were just bouncing around the bed all the time to where she she just shuts the door and she locks it because they figured out how to flip the handles on her bedroom door. So the and they keep trying. So at night that you'll hear the 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 cats like bouncing on their on the door on her bedroom door trying to get in. They're not meowing or anything. They just know they're very clever cats. They is a very easy how to get around anyway um, flat earth and other hot potatoes patricia she got a hold of me back in uh, way back in early in the 2015 and the end of 2015 we uh, we started doing stuff her hair grew out with that stuff was shot out of sequence there's me wearing a very loose shirt oh god i hated that shirt a lot but her hair was really short she cut it off after um one of her original cats died years and years ago and it's me kind of explain our relationship. Uh, and again, the the way they shot this was they made it seem like a current thing, like we were like we were still dating. And it again the the power of editing. We weren't. She was she was already she had already gone to London and was engaged to Antonio, and then she came back, and then uh, um, Antonio ended up dying of throat cancer. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole big drama there. Uh, the, if you want to pick up the book, you can read the whole thing. It was called uh, Over the Edge, uh, written by a woman out in, on the East Coast. And uh, she dedicated a big chapter to Patricia Steer, which was awesome. I, did, I will say this. Patricia, her sense of style was absolutely freaking amazing. She could have been an interior decorator. She could have been a professional makeup artist. She could have been... Uh, 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 fashion designer she could have been just about anything she was she was absolutely class absolutely and i was you know the other guy <laughs> i was she was at least a full octave above my station and the fact that she gave any attention to me at all I was like that's awesome because uh i you know, i mean granted i of course every every i ran into so many people that were uh, instantly attracted to her that uh, there were, in fact we were up at a, at a convenience a gas station in oak harbor when she was up here visiting and uh, looking for a place to rent because she was going to move up here. And I remember, oh, I'm sorry, it was a drugstore. It was Bartels. And the girl who was at the checkout counter, literally just some, I mean, if you see her in person, you just get taken back by it. Where the, the girl who must have been 20 at the counter, she just stops dead in her tracks. And she asked Patricia, because she knew she was, Patricia was older. She was in her 50s. And she goes, how? How do you do it? What is your secret? Right? And, you know, Patricia kind of waves it off. And look, most of us just, you know, she's one of those genetic lottery winners. So anyway, they showed a montage of us meeting and, you know, made it seem like it was just yesterday. It's like, no, those shots were taken at least a year and a half ago before this movie came out. So, but people love the romance. They love the whole will they, won't they type thing. And so we were kind of reliving it for them. And we knew what we were doing, you know, and, and uh, kind of talked about it wistfully. And, and uh, it, was, it was kind of fun. And so those shots are cutting to her back in Houston. This is a shot on the other side of the ferry. We were just walking uh, behind the, the road of houses uh, behind the Muckle, I'm sorry, the uh, Clinton Ferry on Whidbey Island, Washington. We just walked, walked down. That was just Daniel and I. Most of, it, most of the time, it was just Daniel and I, which is awesome. And Patricia, you, you know, you keep cutting. I keep looking the same, and she has all these different looks. Like, oh, by the way, those glasses I was wearing didn't have any lenses in, in them. That was something Patricia and I came up with, which was, okay, we're gonna wear, I'm going to wear the glasses, and how long are people going to figure it out before they notice there's no lenses in them at all? There's no reflective. There's nothing there. And uh, we nobody ever did figure it out, so we finally just gave it away. I love that shot of her. Uh, you know, they they Daniel was took such care in shooting her. 
uh, and uh, it was it was awesome. And she, I don't think she complained about the you know lots of lots of women, especially in her position, would complain about the type of shots. Okay, so the 2017 Flat Earth International Conference. I did the early promos for that. That's me after I'd done working out. And Daniel was like, "Oh yeah, I, I, should I change? No." Okay, sure. Let's let's just shoot then. That's fine. Uh, we we made a lot of different promos. We had no idea what we were doing for the Flat Earth Conference. There's me walking around in Langley. Again, Langley, Washington. There's a theater, a little movie theater in Langley. We never could get them to show behind the curve. They wouldn't even acknowledge us. Nobody from Langley, the Chamber of Commerce, nobody ever contacted me ever about this. Made the paper, you know, made the local paper and all this, but it was it was weird, so weird. And we were walking around um, the city because it, you, you guys probably don't know this, but if you have a camera following you with more than one or two people, immediately you draw attention. Lots of people take selfies, lots of people take movies. But if you walk around and, and you're just a magnet, especially nowadays, it's like, oh, who are they? What are they doing? And so we had these junior high kids that were following us all over the place. As In fact, I think that comes up later where they eventually tracked us down. Oh, yeah, here's a little montage, which I used in the intro of my channel, Dave Chappelle talking about Kyrie Irving. So, again, that was a weird meta thing where Jimmy Kimmel's asking Jave, uh, David Chappelle about Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, a wrestler, I don't follow wrestling, but apparently he's, he's kind of a thing. Uh, Bill Nye, they threw him in there, nice blend, which was, okay, Bill Nye being outraged. Chris Pratt talking on uh, ESPN about, about Flat Earth, where the, one of the hosts is into it, Chris Pratt is not. Uh, another uh, ESPN program where Sha Shaquille O'Neal was, was backing Kyrie for 10 days until his sponsors came in and, and said, yeah, you really can't do that. And then Shaquille O'Neal had to go on Jimmy Kimmel and kind of retract it. Love the fact that uh, Joe here, professor of psychiatry from UCLA, love that they brought him in. And uh, yeah, we, we, we should analyze what's wrong with these people, right? Oh, that was a little Flat Earth Globe thing that somebody sent me. I get, I get most of these trinkets people send me, and then eventually I, I initial them and give them away at meetups and conferences. It was fun. I didn't realize there was a rainbow, by the way, over, over Useless Bay when he shot. That was B-roll that Daniel shot on his own one morning. That was really, really cool. Hannah Lore, going back to her. Again, the hair throws people. Pink hair just throws people. That was Daniel. He had just shot some wonderful B-roll around, well, around Whidbey Island. The Northwest is a beautiful, beautiful place to go during the summer. And so, I, but I encourage, it's like, if anyone ever thinks of moving up to the Northwest, you come here in November, you spend two weeks, you let me know what you think. After 50 degrees and overcast, and you do not see the sun, literally don't see the sun for weeks. Uh, I, I was raised here, so it's different. Yeah, Hanalore again. Uh, the, again, the, the speculation by the science community. And the reason why, part of the reason why this movie worked was uh, they get back and forth. I mean, I sat with a studio on his side. The formula worked, and I don't think the, even the producers. The producers had no faith in this movie at all. Director didn't have... These guys had normal jobs. I mean, normal film jobs down in Los Angeles, and this was a side project for them, like a lot of them. They just make independent films, throw it out there, and hope it, hope it resonates. And the reason why it worked was it was a back and forth. It made people feel safe. It, it wasn't pure, uncut, flat earth. It was flat earth... Here's an astronaut. Flat Earth, here's a scientist. Flat Earth, here's a psychiatrist. And so on and so on. To where, and I could feel the relief in the audience when I sat with them uh, when we were doing the film festivals. It's like, okay, okay, we're fine. We're, we're fine. We're, you know, we're talking to a psychiatrist. And then you got, you know, Neil Tyson every once in a while. It's like, well, we can lean on Neil Tyson, the world's most famous media scientist. Uh, another thing that, by the way, I love their little animation here, which was, it kind of worked in our benefit, and I, I reference it all the time, which was, if you are the one that convinces, I don't convince you about Flat Earth, I don't convince, I, or persuade you, I just put the idea in your head, but if you are the one that convinced yourself about Flat Earth, then how do you snap out of it? Which is why we have a 99% retention rate, that's more than, than most organized religions. Uh, again, mom and I sitting in front of my sister's rose garden, never told her. And then my sister had to find out because when it was finally released on Netflix, you know, they bought it. The Netflix didn't produce it. They bought it. They, uh, uh, the, some of my sister's friends, it's like, oh, your, your house looks so nice and so did your rose garden. Can you imagine that? A family member. It's like all of a sudden or your family member used some of your property for a shot. Again, we didn't mean to. We just happened to be up there at that particular point. And, oh. God, my sister was upset about that. 
she came at me and she was so drunk and so mad, but we got over it. We're we're okay now. High school science teacher, uh, you know, bringing bringing those people in. It's like, oh, what 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 could happen with the kids? What you know, you're you're damaging the future potentially, and social media is changing this. And uh, mom, God bless her. Uh, by the way, the, another person that should have been in the movie. I'll, I'll list a couple of those people as we're going along. Um, would have been my brother-in-law, my my sister's husband. He would have been perfect because he's also a pilot, and he's not a flat earther. But he would have been he would have been great on camera. In fact, they they asked him at one point, and he was absolutely going to do it. He was he was one of those guys that absolutely would have would have gone through with it. But my sister is like, don't you dare! You know, my sister, captain of the cheerleaders when she grew up, Regina George. And uh, she, she was like, no, you're, that's not happening. Bob Nodell, rest in peace, Bob Nodell. He caught cancer uh, a couple years ago uh, and, and died. Um, Tim Osman, not his real name, one of, our, one of our guys. He actually was really good at a couple things. He did one of his own little festivals down in, in New Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. And he also um, led Flat Earth uh, chat raids. He was like, he invented that where he'd get like three or four hundred flat earthers in a chat room and then find someone any other chat room that was doing a live stream and we just come in there and start spamming flat earth stuff and you know bob bob and cammy oh by the way that's cammy nodell his wife uh next to him sitting there that was awesome again trying to isolate people trying to make you know anything that was weird sort of like with the conference people trying to trying to make it seem as fringe as possible and uh, I, I don't remember exactly if this was a meetup that, that Bob did, but oh yeah, another psychologist. They didn't bring in just one psychologist. They brought in several trying to analyze why this is happening. Why is Flat Earth a thing? And uh, it's like, well, because it resonated. That's, that's the biggest thing. Flat Earth, Flat Earth resonated with a lot of people out there, um, especially in the truther community. If you want to say conspiracy community, community, that's fine. We don't really care that much. But it really is the truth, truther community, which is people are looking for the truth. People are looking for something beyond the face value headlines. Um, Bob, by the way, is a big guy. He's just saying, wow, he's pretty, he's pretty tall. Yeah, I think he was like 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Big, big guy. Last time I saw him was at uh, Flattoberfest a couple of years ago. He didn't look good. Um, wasn't a big believer in doctors. And like a lot of people, you know, when you have uh, Infinite Plane Society, that was his channel, by the way. Um, if you, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole chemotherapy thing, he wasn't wasn't a believer. And it's like, nope, it's a stall. I'm not doing it. Quality of life. I, I completely believe with him, believe him with that. And uh, look, 70% of oncologists, when faced with cancer themselves, don't do the treatment. Treatment's brutal. It's like it's like being injected with rattlesnake poison. It's like, oh, by the way, if you survive this, it'll buy you a little time. But uh, it's a gamble, and I'm a big believer of quality of life. Old school. You know what? If it's your time, it's your time. Uh, I'm big, you know. I won't say I'm a strong, strong Christian, but if God knocks on your door, why do you run away? There you go. Uh, my little, again, I love the anim, who, who did the animation for all this stuff. I never met the guy, but the, the Scottish Highlands, which the reference, which was that we have a lot of disagreement in the flat earth community, but at the end of the day, we all hate the globe. That's why we can do conferences. That's why we can do gatherings and, and nobody goes to blows. Uh, oh, the Monty Python reference. I'm so glad they got to use this and, and throw this in there, which was, this is from Life of Brian, when uh, Brian drops the shoe. And they're interpreting it. It was such quality writing, which there was it that started spawned metaphorically all these religions. What's the meaning of the drop shoe? He just dropped the shoe accidentally, and it's like the meaning of the drop shoe. And they got to, they got to use the copyright and use this clip in there, and it was it was fun. I was so glad they did that because Monty Python had some smart smart writing. Uh, Nicole Cote, she she did animation for me for a couple of different things, which was fun. I don't know everybody's. And there's Matt Boyland. Oh, good Lord. Matt Boyland. So but you'll run into him later. You know, he never did. You know, he's in this movie quite a bit, but he, they never did talk to him directly because he argued about terms. Again, he had already done stuff, bit, bit parts in Hollywood. He was one of those Canadian actors who wanted to get, he wanted to be a movie star. And he started out in, in as a comedian and wanted to, uh, so he went down to L.A. And, and tried his bit. And I will say this, the guy is a very, very talented in a lot of different aspects. I love his paintings, but he 
had problems with oh, well, oh good lord uh, he wanted to get american citizenship so he ran from montreal and drove around the country looking for a wife so he could marry into citizenship and he got it he, he found it in vegas which was awesome uh and yeah the the early story here where matt uh wouldn't take calls from the media People were calling me to get to Matt. So many producers for like three or four years were, were calling me, asking me about Matt, Matt Boyland, saying, uh, yeah, and he got mad because by the time he was ready to talk to the media, they didn't want to talk to him anymore. It was like, why? Flat Earth was, the ball had, the train had already left the station and Matt was, was already back fuming about why they weren't talking to him in the, in the first place. So, yeah, Matt, the, uh, the, who would have been king of Flat Earth. Now, it turns out later, I, who knew, that uh, the man, uh, for all his gifts, uh, could not, uh, he wasn't very articulate and couldn't, couldn't do uh, interviews very well. I, I, because he was so freaking twitchy, so, so paranoid about uh, that everyone was listening to him. And uh, he, scared, he scared the producers and directors at one point. He was he's just like, wow, I don't know if we can get in a room with this guy. Because he's going to, again, try to dictate terms. And uh, uh, now the rumor is, here we are seven years later, um, the rumor is he's actually, because he always wanted to do this. I think he's living in Central America. He wanted to make a whole bunch of money and start his own uh, Jim Jones thing, <laughs> kind of like French Guyana. He wa you know, just basically wanted to live on a tropical island in his own compound with uh, a whole bunch of beautiful women uh, at his beck and call. That is, that is, that is what he wanted to do. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. And so, and there, that, by the way, that girl behind him, I think, yeah, that's the girl he ended up marrying and had a kid with. That's my sis, my, uh, my mom and I walking up my sister's driveway. I don't even know if my sister got to this part. I don't even know if she watched the whole thing. But if she did, this would have been like one of the nails in the coffin. It's like, what, well, this is my driveway too? Again, it was just a nice sunny day on Woodby Island. And uh, Daniel, I remember my mom and I, after we, the director left, it's like, well, should we tell my sister? It's like, no, they're not going to, they're not actually going to use this scene. So yeah, Matt, when asked to appear in the film, Matt stipulated they'd receive $5,000, 12% of the profits, creative control, a guarantee they'd be featured in 25, 50% of the film. And that the heat that the movie condemned me as a, uh, a secret Warner Brothers agent, and they said, and they had uh, the fact that you put that in a film. That disclaimer was awesome. That was basically their 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 note to him, saying, "Yeah, this is why we didn't put you in the movie. You know why we didn't make you s even sign the waiver, and why and a message to other producers." And he was never shoulder tapped for anything else in the future because they, they it's like. There are difficult actors, and then there's guys like this. I mean, Robert Downey Jr., that's one thing, right? God bless him. But Matt, he's a whole other thing. Uh, the stick that I was holding, by the way, because uh, I like props, the the stick, but that's the Apollo 17 image. Uh, the stick that I was holding in that beach shot, the director made me throw away at one point. He's like, all right, enough of the stick. Get rid of it. Because he, he, for whatever reason, was starting to bug him. I think I was, I was getting too comfortable with it. Like, I was twirling it around like Jim Carrey and the Joker. Oh, yeah. Uh, forward and backward flips. There you go. Commander Scott Kelly, who's now going to be a politician. Kept the secret. Colonel. I, I, believe he, I believe he was a full board colonel in the U.S. Air Force. Most of them are, by the way, which is an argument I, I throw at people. People say, well, are you accusing the astronauts of, like Terry Virts of being a liar? It's like, no. He's a military officer. If you make full bird colonel, you know how to keep secrets. That's the whole point. I mean, there's not, can't go up much further than that, uh, you know, without going into serious administration. Uh, Nathan Thompson, cutting back to him, which is awesome. Again, his color choices, don't know. Love Patricia's little, she was so, her attention to detail was amazing. Like the, the little guitar lesson thing over there. I don't think she could play guitar. She had some guitars that were given to her. Oh, yeah, ODD, which will come into play later. Uh, he's a big YouTuber uh, in our community, one of the highest, in fact, I think he's the highest we've got. Uh, he's in the mid six figures for Flat Earth, which is pretty big. And uh, yeah, talking about other conspiracies. This is where they delve into it. It's like, okay, what else are Flat Earthers into? And flat, again, because you're not, if you're into Flat Earth, you're, you're not just into Flat Earth. You're into all sorts of stuff. And they want to dig into it. Remember, this was pre a few years before the pandemic. Had this been shot later, thank God we had to shoot it when we did. Uh, had this been shot later, we would have gone into the whole anti-shot thing. So ODD was up there, uh, you know, in the front talking to people. And ODD, and I'll, I'll say this before we get to the Robbie Davids thing, he was, and I don't think we even brought in, Eric DeBay was supposed to also supposed to be in this movie. Absolutely was supposed to be in this movie. That They contacted me early on and said, can we get Eric DeBay? 
and they they also asked, does anybody have skeletons in their closet? You know, like murder or whatever. And I actually gave him my fireworks story because you know, federal felon, that whole thing about making illegal explosives. Uh, which was interesting, you know, they didn't focus on that too much. But when it came to uh, Eric Dubé, it's like, well, you know, he's made some anti-Semitic things. And they didn't even blink. They said, oh, yeah, he's done. We're, we're, we're done. Oh, and, and they, in fact, I showed him a couple of them and they said, yeah, we can, we can never use him. So Eric Dubé was supposed to be in it. Why do I mention that? Because ODD was a huge fan of Eric Dubé. And Eric said, you shouldn't go to the conference, which he didn't. And he goes, and anyone that follows your stuff on your channel, you shouldn't, you should tell them not to go, which was really interesting because it was a non-refundable conference. So the 2017 conference, the, I, that was Robbie Davidson coming in. He goes, by the way, there's going to be like 100, 150 pe- seats in the back that aren't going to be filled, even though they're paid for. They're, they, you know, it was sold out. And he, and I go, why? Because because ODD's people said, eat the, you know, said, eat the money, don't go. It's me walking through Langley again, research flat earth. We rotated a bunch of, a bunch of t-shirts. I think they were all black uh, for, I think, two years. I got nothing but black t-shirts. Trish Stair doing her thing. There's Matt Boylan. Oh, yeah. Matt made a whole, a whole series of videos. And he loved doing stuff like this, where he's talking to somebody, he's doing a video call, and then he'd record himself doing the video call with somebody from an angle and then release that as sort of a new a new thing so Trisha Steer of course the jukebox in the back which I'm 90% sure she still has we haven't talked in a couple of years uh, but rumor has it she's going to be coming back to the community pretty soon the troll we put people wondering why oh yeah people went after Patricia oh my god did they go after Patricia um, for three reasons. Uh, she was, again, the internet is just harsh. It's a cruel world. Uh, you know, it's, uh, men rule the world and the internet even more so. And so when you are, I mean, she was a triple threat. She was attractive. She was rich. <laughs> and uh, she was Jewish on top of that. And she'll say, well, only my mom was, was you know, half, half Jewish. Her, her mom was full Ashkenazi. I was like, that's all you need between those three things. You, you know, she had a huge target on her back. And on top of it, and a lot of people know this already, she read every single comment that was put in there. And the trolls knew it. She read and sanitized every single comment. And I said, after a while, you are going to snap because you can't read, especially, you know, you start making 50 videos, 100 videos. You have to go through each one. I mean, the comments just keep piling up. And she wasn't responding to them. She was just deleting them and blocking those people all the time in fact not only she do that she even asked uh, and she she was at one point a moderator on my channel she goes i want to start sanitizing that's such a great shot of her um uh started moderating videos on my channel and it was it was tough for her you know got brothers there's Patricia when she was young um there's a one i've got a wonderful montage video of her on uh, on my channel when she was being accused of being a guy by her ex-fiance out of britain uh, the night shots, they were so, they were so wonderfully done. And it's a funny thing, you know, when I, when you look at that montage, when she was one of those women, one of those lucky, lucky women that when she hit 13, she was imme- immediately attractive and that never changed. She, ne- and I, in fact, I, you know, I'm going through, you know, the album of, you know, her from 13 all the way through 50. And I go, was there at any point where you weren't, you know, to use the Zoolander line, really ridiculously good looking? And she goes, well, there was this, there was these couple months during my sophomore year of high school that I felt a little awkward. I go, a she couple months in <laughs> high school? Oh, my God. Uh, they followed me to this little podcast, by the way, in California. So we were in California shooting some other stuff, and uh, I went to a, a podcast out there and, and shot some things with this guy, which was kind of fun. That uh, was one of my early, early, early podcasts. I mean, that was 20, 2017, and that was the guy that drove me around. And... Anyway, so yeah, Patricia was was uh, she caught a lot of hell from a lot of trolls and eventually just walked away from it. They did a wellness check in her house that was not very fun, and uh, they they that that and the again you can read it in the the book Over the Edge, where uh, she didn't get a lot of support from the flat Earth community. I'll say this on air, I don't mind. Where um, she accused Antonio, her former fiance, of rape when she was over there in London getting ready to marry him. It's like, oh, that's going to be a tough sell. Oh, uh, anyway, so the, the community was, was split on it, and she wanted unanimous, unanimous support. Okay, so there's Chris Pontius, the man, the genius, who, who oh, God, there's so much stuff. And that was the, the custom bike that he made with this wood overlay, which is just gorgeous. That's all wood. 
Uh, so obviously you're not driving in bad weather. And the producers told me, and this is in the director's commentary as well, is that they, when they were shooting the raw footage, when Daniel was up there shooting uh, all of Chris Pontius' stuff, uh, they would, when they were doing the editing for this movie, they would sometimes during their lunch breaks just sit and watch the uncut footage, the hours and hours of Chris Pontius model, model building. It was, it was therapeutic, it was cathartic, where it was just so fun to watch him in his workshop there, uh, making all these beautiful models, I mean, with the, with the great hardwoods, and I mean, the time, and everything was just so custom crafted, and it was only him. He was the only one that was making it. He nev I never saw him with an assistant, uh, and he sold this stuff for pretty, pretty pricey. Uh, you know, some of those bigger ones were pushing, I think, a grand. If you, you, you can't even find him now. Uh, go on eBay. Uh, I don't. I, th I think every, here, here's how you know the love of the Flat Earth community. Just about everyone that's got some of these models, uh, they don't sell them. They they hold on to them. Uh, I mean, I've got three. I wish I had more. Uh, there was some just wonderful, wonderful stuff that uh, Chris had, Chris had made, and he you know he started simple with a couple lights, and that's yeah. I've I've still got that one. Uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll ever get rid of it. It's just gorgeous, and he ended up. Um, uh, adding LEDs to them. I, I can't remember if they do some night shots. He named it, you know, made, did it official, named and signed and numbered every one of these in a row that he did. Uh, he made, uh, it was in the triple, low triple digits, I think he made before he ended up moving his shop. Uh, I really hope he gets back into it. Uh, and I'm really surprised by the way, you know, nobody in the Flyers community copyrighted anything. So it was kind of fun to, you know, because the, and because of that, you would have thought that somebody would have come in and mass produced. And yes, you can go on eBay and there's at least two or three companies that make small flat earth domes. I think they're less than uh, eight inches across. And he, Chris, just the stuff he made, oh God, they were great. And that's him making his own domes. That's why he, ended up, he couldn't even buy the stuff he, he wanted, to, wanted to use. So he had to custom make his own domes. And uh, they, like I said, the producers would watch him do this, the, the raw footage for hours. There was just so much good stuff. It's just a clinic on how to build a, a quality flat earth model. And the music they chose was awesome. Uh, it was it was great. And of course he had his cats with him. Everybody had cats! It, it was just weird, a weird coincidence that, that everybody uh, that, that we use in the main stuff had cats. Trisha had, had cats, uh, I, had, I had Bitsy. Jaren had cats, we'll get into. Um, but, but Chris Pontius, Again, the the labor of love that he put into this. I mean, I'm mesmerized just watching these little segments here. He just did wonderful, wonderful stuff. So, if you're wondering why, and it really shows when you're looking at them, when you're holding them. In fact, he made me the last one he made for me was a little nine-inch model that he wanted me that would fit in my bag whenever I traveled uh, and did international stuff. He he did one when I did this UK uh, television show over in London. Uh, that's when he called me. He goes, he goes, I'm sending you a nine inch model so you can put it in your thing. So, because the, he, cause you can't take like a little handheld, uh, little three inch model. It just doesn't show up well on camera. So I'm going to send you one of mine. And that was the, that was the last one I got. So hopefully, you know, hopefully Chris will get back into it. So the Johnson Space Center, uh, we went out there, um, uh, Daniel and I, and, uh, I think Caroline was there and Patricia. And we went around and actually were in the Apollo section, which we'll get into. But, uh, okay, so let's get back into, so there's Jaron Campanella, seven years ago, the experimenter. Jaron, part of the original Ghostbusters team, sorry, Globebusters team. Sorry, a little subliminal slip there. Uh, there's Bob in his office talking about how Bob and Jaron met. Bob's son, by the way, his his surviving son, uh, one, of the, the, one of the true white hackers of the world, one of the white hats. Uh, he, his name is actually Jaron. Go figure. And uh, that it was again. So these two knew they were gonna be spending time to, with each other. Uh, Bob's son, who I don't think is in this movie, I got to mention real quick a little side story about Bob's son. Um, you know, Bob and Cammy, really intelligent people, high IQ type people. So what what happens when eugenics runs into that combination? You get a son who starts hacking stuff you know at the age of you know 13 14 and i think he was 15 when he hacked fortnite and just for fun right and just to have some fun and what he did was he sent he he unlocked behind the scenes uh some of the christmas skins that weren't even released yet and he decided to have some fun and send some screenshots to forbes magazine 
and Forbes magazine, of course, printed the screenshots, ran a story, but they didn't they didn't mask his account number, you know. And and it, of course, again, rookie, you know, kid, fifteen, he didn't know that they wouldn't do that. And so the Fortnite, it's like, oh yeah, so we know exactly who this kid is. And next thing you know. Uh, Bob and Cammy, his parents, get a cease and desist letter FedEx to them from from Fortnite's attorneys, from Epic Games attorneys, and uh, you know saying, "Hey," uh, because they couldn't send to him because he was underage, and they ended up um, uh, was of course you, you know what was going to happen after this was you know cease and desist, and then behind the scenes it's like, "Oh yeah, we got to hire this kid," and they did even before he was eighteen, they hired him and they said, "We'll pay you," I think like what was it like a thousand dollars per bug. If you find what if you find a bug, and this kid was good at finding any of this stuff, and this kid was making some decent change, and uh, I don't know if he's still working for him now, but uh, yeah, he's one of those uh, goodwill hunting in the world in the world of uh, hackers. He, he's one of those guys. He he can absolutely just rip it up. So it's really really awesome. Okay, so sorry, I was I was getting off on a tangent there. Um, yeah, and talking to the montage. You notice how they're they're focusing now on on anti flat earthers. You know, science community jumping back to, to Bob with the globe, which was kind of fun. I don't know what that's. Oh, that was a telescope back in the background. I never really noticed that till till now. Uh, we'll talk about the laser gyroscope real quick, which was again uh, uh, one of our donors gave us twenty thousand dollars to buy a ring laser gyro. People say, oh, it's a waste of time. And I'll, I'll be as simple as I can here. Does it, did it detect a 15 degree uh, shift in the sky per hour? Yes. The question is, is it the sky or is it the globe? That's all it really comes down to, which is uh, science will say, oh, no, the earth is moving and 15 degrees per hour. And we'll say, oh, no, it's the sky that's moving 15 degrees per hour. That's it. That, that, that is the argument. And I, they went off about this back and forth. Oh, yes, here we are chipping away at the flat earth, whatever. And um, uh, for me, that's the, it, it's a push because most people, the, the general population doesn't even know what that means anyway. Kind of like when we get to the laser experiment at the end, which was, uh, you know, yeah, there were some people in the audience that laughed, but they didn't know what they were laughing about because nobody at that point. Again, you only try to introduce somebody to Flat Earth with this 100 minutes later. It's like, whatever. Uh, what is this? It's, this is inside. Oh, yeah. This is Patricia Steers living room. That's us eating popcorn. The um, watching Dark City of all things. And uh, I think I referenced Dark City a few times in the clues. And Patricia, I don't know if I've ever seen it. Uh, and again, Daniel, that was the last Daniel uh, was there. And then he left us that night and I crashed in Patricia's bedroom, or not bedroom, uh, in her guest bedroom. Because uh, we were, uh, again, not dating at the time. And I think we made way, way too much popcorn. Um, that's us at one of the Air and Space Museums. I think that was the one that was in Seattle. And just kind of us walking around, shooting some stuff uh, that, that, was, that was done before the, we were shooting the documentary. That's us driving on our way to the Johnson Space Center in Patricia's car. And that was kind of fun. And I lost my train of thought because I get distracted every time Patricia's on the screen. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, East NASA Parkway, very nice shot. There are a couple things I want to mention this. Where, so uh, we were, because, <clears throat> again, it was a shoestring budget, and when you call up, when he called up NASA, it's like, hey, can we shoot there? They, they, just, they just say, oh, yeah, $5,000 fee, uh, and you got to fill out a permit. And, he's like, and, and the director's like, you know what, let's just go in. Screw it, you know, $5,000. We, we're pretty sure it was just like a token fee. So, like, the people that want to pay it, pay it. The ones that don't, don't. And so Daniel was, we were doing this sort of guerrilla filmmaking in there. And the only thing they cared about, the only thing they yelled at us for, that was a great outfit by Patricia, the, um, uh, the only thing they were yelling at us for in the, in the movie was Patricia's selfie stick. It, sa it literally says it outside. It's like no selfie sticks. And, of course, she breaks out the selfie stick because that's, that's what she does. And... It's like, really? And, and the reason was is because social media was starting to ramp up when we were, we were shooting this, and there were people bumping into each other all the time, apparently, using selfie sticks. We went in, though, when there was hardly anyone there. And I got to tell you, the, that, that Johnson Space Center, it came off as like an, L, uh, like an older amusement park. Everything was worn. Everything was dated. Uh, there was no upkeep. You could tell the employees. I mean, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm in this place. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's, there's me sitting in front of the green button. And again, there's only one button there. And this is this was the big laugh moment, which was in fact they even tell you it's like hit hit the button, and I hit the button down below and it wasn't working, so I was like thinking, okay, is it a touch screen? It's like no, the, this was too old school, 
and uh, you try to hit the screen that was not a touch screen and walking away and as we're walking away again power of editing they leave the camera on the green button like i had never hit it and that got a laugh and in fact the the producer and the director even asked me when we were at the premiere in the toronto was like oh is it okay if we did this and, and and i said yeah sure it's a good it's a good gag but again the power of editing so outside of the main space center is this building this warehouse and we just happened to be in there uh, by the way, shout out to one of my friends, Brian, who hated me for wearing shorts in the movie. And it's like, what are you talking about? I have nice legs, but he just doesn't agree with shorts in a movie. It's like, it's hot. It's 100 freaking degrees. Patricia's not wearing shoulders. Her, her back's exposed. I can't wear shorts. Whatever. So we're in the Apollo thing, and we just happened to be there when no one was there. We were the only people in the entire thing. And what we didn't know is every once in a while, tour groups would walk through here. And it was it was again uh, this wonderful moment where where we were it's like the the space the whole space program was so dated that here it is you know the, the greatest rocket in the history of america no one was there and so it's like yeah you know what let's shoot this let's let's talk about you know the the fact that um uh, the space program is a dated program, and one of the reasons why we gained so much traction is nobody's even talked about going to the moon or, or being on the moon since 1972. The Americans went. Nobody else even tried. It's not that other countries went and failed. Nobody else even tried to go, and they just ki they've been kicking the same can down the road for 50 years, which is every president since freaking what Carter, Reagan. Uh, everyone says, oh, we're committed to going back in the moon, you know, and think of how many presidents we've had since then. 50 freaking years of, of that stuff, just over and over and over again. And now um, SpaceX, you know, the Artemis program uh, is kicking it down again uh, for at least until 2025. And I guarantee you we get 2025 if we get that far. Uh, it's going to be kicked down the, the road again. This was the cute point where Patricia and I are sitting next to each other doing a podcast next to each other for the first time in you know squeezed together in her in her uh side room with professional lighting and uh there's this moment coming up where the audience there's that heartfelt tug because uh you know it's it's time to say goodbye and it's like oh i don't want to go and i didn't want to go you know there was patricia and i had spent enough t time together during this trip that uh you know some old feelings were were still there and uh it was it was it was kind of nice but Again, we haven't spoken in some time. Uh, the, I'm trying to think of what else. Really interesting, by the way. She's just older enough that the Smiths, I mean, that's her favorite band of all time. She's got all their albums, and the jukebox is jammed full of Smiths uh, songs. And I, I remember, again, I, I had a couple Smith songs on playlists when I was in college. Uh, up at Western Washington University, uh, you know, and some guys, some cool guys, guys that knew cool music. They put the Smiths on. Um, I think it was the the big one was at "How Soon Is Now," and uh, yeah, that's it, a great song. I, I love that song. The other stuff, yeah, it's okay, but but that was her that was her thing. Uh, her cats were really really great. I, I loved her cats. I thought they were too thin personally, but whatever. That's uh, that's my Canadian hat that she's trying on. There's Canadian uh, Canada thing on the back. And that's a weird hat, by the way. You get that hat from the Canadian, uh, I think, Department of Wildlife if you find a fish, because they tag fish to check migrations. And uh, if, you, if you catch a fish with a special tag on it, you can mail it to them, and they will send you something, like a fishing pole or a hat or, or a jacket or something like that. It's really, Canada's weird. I lived there for a year uh, in Victoria from uh, beginning of 2016 to the beginning of 2017 and it was uh i learned so much about canada say this is a meetup uh in colorado a lot of people don't know that when i wrote the clues bob was in colorado odd was in colorado and i was in colorado at the same time and we never met uh each other until this moment when bob and odd uh, were were at the same thing apparently they live like just very short very close to each other there's cammy she's wonderful and um, Bob was, what was Bob doing? Oh yeah, that the reason why the, the the shot coming up here was Bob was wearing hot mics. A lot of people we, were, we you know we wear hot mics, you know, little microphones. And the whole point of hot mics is they want you to get comfortable enough with hot hot mics 
is that you don't um uh jaron or jaron talking about his experiment here is that you get comfortable and eventually you forget you're wearing hot, hot mics because they want you to say something that's out of character they they want you to not be thinking about the camera they want you to to not be thinking about the microphones and so there was that part where bob was uh was talking about the ring laser gyro and oh i hope people don't find about the results or they're going to go after us uh which was true which is look 15 degrees because they were trying to stop the whole point of their experiments was they were trying to stop the 15 degree per hour shift being measured and they couldn't do it they never could stop it so but again does that prove that the earth is a globe nope just proves there's a 15 degree per hour shift um, Jaron, that was him. Uh, there's Jaron outside. By the way, Jaron hated this shot. I think that was his neighbor's house, by the way. This is like, it's like, oh my God, I look poor. And it's like, yeah, yeah, again, the, the power of editing. So there's Jaron with one of his early lasers. Pretty impressive, by the way. You can see that during the day. But of course, it wasn't sunny. Um, but that was him, you know, getting ready with the lasers. We had, again, we were just winging it uh, with the laser experiments. We didn't know what to do. Like, we didn't know, for example, that laser, if you left it on long enough, uh, without a, a special condenser or, or again all lasers you're not supposed to leave them on 24 7 uh, or really even an hour because they will melt things nowadays the, the lasers are so powerful that um, they'll melt things so anyway they were talking about the laser test and we'll talk about the laser test as, as we get closer to the end uh, by the way, uh, shout out to, to Nick, the guy that was editing uh, this, uh, you know, I, now that I've, because I, I haven't watched this in a few years, and now that I'm just staring at it intently at point blank range, because I'm watching this on my computer as I do this, uh, it was, it was, he, he did a great job, and wonderful intersplicing of media that's going on. So the eclipse, uh, the, the big eclipse, as you guys know, and there's an eclipse coming up here uh, on the 8th of April, we're now in 2024. The 2017 eclipse, seven years ago, part of the reason why I'm making this, is that uh, they were they they wanted to bring me down to the eclipse because the eclipse in 2017 was going from Oregon, in the United States, from the northwest down to the southeast and and leaving off of I think South Carolina. Oh yeah, by the way, Brian Hickey, again one of the people. Uh, yeah, he he said kind things about flat Earther and once. And I said, oh yeah, he's one of ours kind of like the peer pressure thing which which is like hey you don't you're not really friends with them are you it's like no no i'm not you know again peer pressure is a powerful thing 90 percent of our 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 community members are in the closet i've talked to so many people so many people that said I, of course made the mistake of saying that on camera i didn't think they'd use it it's like oh yeah he's absolutely flat flat, flat earth friendly and that's why he was smiling he's like oh no we're fine whatever 90 percent of the flat earth community so there's there's mom uh, oh, we put extra, we, the little quick thing. So we put extra gas tanks in the back of my car and heading on the ferry, well, the Tokati, and heading, heading off to um, Oregon for the eclipse. The extra gas tanks were because we heard there was going to be this massive, again, the eclipse, we were going to be so many people going to be in town. And because people are lazy, there wasn't. Uh, we were afraid we could, we'd be able to gas at gas stations. The, those gas tanks were also for the director. We took two cars, obviously, because uh, I had to drive and uh, uh, they were behind me. And we also uh, did a flat earth advertisement on the billboard that was in the eclipse zone. And we had, uh, we had to walk from the hotel over to this. And that highway, by the way, so what happened was the very next morning during the eclipse was just nobody, everyone waits till the last minute. And so there were a bunch of people that jammed onto the highway and it was crowded and realized it's like, oh, we're not gonna make it to the eclipse zone. So everybody turned around. So the, the city that we were in to shoot the eclipse footage, and we're so glad that the, the weather was nice. Um, we were there the night before walking around. It's like you could have shot a cannon through the streets. No one was there. It was this running joke. Again, the power of editing. You, you uh, and They made it seem like it was going to be this huge rush of people. Like So there's the next morning. That's the eclipse morning. And that park should have been absolutely jammed to the gills. And there wasn't. And there's this giant globe. This first time we were walking through. Uh, and uh, we're, we were just kind of walking on the outside. It wasn't super, super crowded. Beautiful park, by the way. A gorgeous bridge. And it just turns out there was this massive globe that nobody knew about. I think it was huge, like 30, 30 freaking feet tall. It was cool. I'd never seen anything like it uh, that was handcrafted like that. And how appropriate that we would be watching. And that was, by the way, that guy I'm talking to right to right there, that if I'm not mistaken, that is one one of our other uh, mercenary cameramen. We, um, so Daniel did, the director did most of the, the cinematography himself. But every once in a while, when we wanted to shoot sort of people within people, 
he would hire mercenary uh, cameramen, I think in Los Angeles and uh, in Oregon, to just local cameramen, you know, you get paid, you, you shoot the footage, you give the footage to the director, and then you go away. And uh, you, you, you get a credit at the end of the thing. And then we were walking around the streets. By the way, that, that was the town the, the day before. The eclipse. Nobody there around the entire town. That, that shot was the day before. We ran to one guy. We had to track him down. What do you think of Flat Earth? And he's like, I don't believe in it. So that, that it didn't end up as well as we had hoped. Um, meanwhile, uh, they were doing some balloon. Oh, no. This was a, a previous balloon shot. I don't know who was launching that particular one. Oh, no. That was during the eclipse day. Good. Yeah, there was. I will say this: out in Oregon, there were a bunch of people that flew in on private planes to places in Oregon. By the way, you see the bending; it's going okay. The the horizon is is bending both ways because they're using a fisheye lens, which you really shouldn't. Uh, there's me watching the eclipse as we get close, and and Daniel, I remember the photographers were really disappointed because they couldn't figure out what lens to use to get close enough to when to show the eclipse close up. They couldn't do it. So the best they could do was shoot me uh, at different angles with the eclipse in the background. That is about as close as they could get. Whenever they zoomed in, they couldn't get it into focus, which was so weird. Uh, and uh, it was really cool, though. You know, as soon as they did it, the, the place went dark and, and you could hear the crickets in the background. It was surreal. If you ever have the chance to, to be in an eclipse, it's, it's awesome. It's, uh, it's the closest thing to magic. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's as close as you get right there. Uh, they wanted to zoom in all the way, but they couldn't. That that trail in the background, that uh, that that airplane trail uh, that was up uh, ahead of me, was uh, that was a NASA plane because the only planes that were flying around in that area were science planes, flying around trying to trying to take different shots. And it was really cool. It was it was a perfect eclipse day because there weren't that many people, and there uh, it, it wasn't this frantic thing. Of course, now seven years later, uh, the eclipse is being touted as this uh, this apocalyptic ending i mean the christian community is really really latched on to it and i agree hey look the 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 nineveh thing n-i-n-e-v-a-h towns thing is pretty weird but i'm still not going to call it a, a biblical sort of event do i think it could turn into some sort of false flag thing yeah sure possibly uh but uh, oh yeah we made um special t-shirts for that and I don't even know who made them. For. Oh, yeah, that was uh, that was my friend Brian. He had he made special T-shirts for me to wear this. Okay, now we're back on Whidbey Island. That is the parking lot of the Star Store, which is in Langley, Washington. And it just turns out, oh, hey, when we were there, lucked out. The uh, Solar Eclipse 2017 and right below it, Flat Earth from Skeptic to Believer. Now, again, interesting. That I think the only reason I made the front page of the local paper that day was because there was an eclipse. Uh, and oh yeah, that, there's a still shot. There's me winning my my pinball tournament, and you know, kind of doing a quick montage of, of how weird my life was going from childhood to now. And they had me read the article, where of course the 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 article said that the guy the they, they absolutely of course they weren't gonna say they were in the flat Earth. Why would you? Why why would you say that? So I I. I I get it. Again, most most of your media. I don't. Again, I don't care about the hosts. I care about the readers. I care about the viewers. Which is the host isn't going to flip on you. Uh, you you're not going to get a, a major host of any media thing that's going to be like, oh yeah, I'm totally with you. No. But occasionally you might run into somebody, but chances are they're going to be into the truth or community anyway. There's mom yet again with her CI again shooting in front of my sister's rose bushes. That got me in so much trouble. Uh, oh, yeah. And by the way, she was she was mad at mom, too, because the whole reason that you can, if you don't know, if you sign the um, the release forms, you can wherever you are, they can shoot you. And it's your responsibility. Uh, it, at, at one point, Minda's like, I should sue. And it's like, no, don't think you can sue because because uh, we were there and it was our responsibility to let them know that you probably couldn't you know, do that. That's me looking out uh, out. Uh, on the waterfront in Langley, Washington, which was kind of fun. Uh, where else could I go with this? I need a talking point. Psychologists, me reading the article. This is sort of the the, the low point. So yeah, again, hero's journeys. You got to read the low point, which is the local paper says that Mark is probably crazy and he's wrong about flat Earth and the whole community is insane. Now we go back down to California, Pasadena. We went to a uh, local meetup. And the meetup, the, again, if you don't know anything, it's me autographing some stuff. 
Uh, if you don't know anything about this, you can't, when you're in Los Angeles, New York and Los Angeles has special rules when it comes to shooting things. So even though the meetup was in this restaurant right there, and you could shoot it from a distance, you could not walk in the restaurant with the camera. And that is because, in case there's any celebrity there or anybody that wants their privacy, um, the restaurant is is on the hook for that. So the restaurant, um, didn't, don't, they don't even blink. It was like, nope, you were out. So we had to shoot from a distance. Five blocks away, turns out the science community was running a, a little meetup of their own. Astronomy on tap. Nerds. Super nerd fest. And, uh, you know, the talking, I, I think they mentioned at one point, so they could get on camera, that flat earthers were down the street. And, uh, again, part of the reason flat earth does so well is because, uh, and I'll be as honest as I can here uh, without being mean, is that the math clubs and the physics clubs, which all these people would have been in, they are very, very small in the education system compared to the rest of it. No band, track, football, big. Math club and physics club and chess club, really, really small. There's Renee. I'm so glad Renee made, made it into the movie. I got he's he still does meetups uh, every couple months down in Los Angeles, down in Huntington Beach, and they're great. I got to stay down there. Um, Renee's a, a great guy. Um, the, the anyway, so um, physics club, math club, really, really small. Everybody else really, really big. So I don't, I don't care about converting them. If you know, getting the mer, if yeah, if we could get any nerds, sure, that'd be great. But uh, they're too invested. I mean, they again, science is their religion. Science is their institution. Uh, oh, there's Dan the Waterman, by the way, one of our guys down there, and uh, very enthusiastic. He did lots of street activism. Uh, Dan the Waterman. He, in fact, he was uh, there for I think the Nat Geo documentary. I think he was. I think he got a bit part in that. So the. Uh, uh, again, we had to, what, what we had to do is we had to drag people to interview them. We had to drag them out of the restaurant, which they didn't want to leave because they, when you're in a flat earth group, you want to keep hanging out with flat earthers. And we had to drag him out of the restaurant and shoot outside, uh, you know, outside the restaurant, far outside to where the restaurant people could not see us. And so that was one of the only times the director was like, yeah, we're going to be cautious about this. But it meant, again, he's from Los Angeles. He knows the rules when it, when it comes to that. So again, back here when the, the 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 nerds, I shouldn't I shouldn't poke too much fun at the nerds, but the science is the religion. It is what they are invested in. If you are if you believe, science science is your institution. You science and religion, state and church, has, they have never melded. They're never going to melt. Science believes that we are an accident. You know that we are left over from the Big Bang, and we believe that we are very very deliberate. And flat Earth really flies in the face of science. Because if you believe in flat earth, then you believe in a giant studio, a giant apartment, a giant snow globe, which was absolutely built by someone. And even if you don't believe in the divine, it completely blows away the whole Big Bang thing. Uh, because, again, we don't believe in, in space. We just believe it's, it's again, on a ceiling of a planetarium. So, by the way, some of those other cutscenes were from uh, something else, and I can't remember... Um, uh, so yeah, eventually we started dragging more and more people out there and, you know, for taking selfies and, and some shots. And, and once they knew, again, Los Angeles people, once they knew they were put potentially being a documentary, even though there was a 90% chance the documentary was not going to go anywhere, they, uh, uh, that we went out. Okay. So the, I am Mark Sargent shirt. I gotta, gotta mention this really fast. So why I am Mark Sargent? I did not design this shirt. This shirt was a complete takeoff of the 1999 highest rated movie in 1999. You can look on IMDb called Fight Club with Brad Pitt and Ed Norton. And uh, the greatest, in fact, the greatest year in movies was 1999. I challenge anybody to look it up. Uh, you'll, you'll see the list of movies that never got better. Oh, look at that. I'm sorry, there's people I recognize. Um, uh, the second greatest year in movies was 1984. I, I, I firmly agree, uh, agree with everyone that, that came at me with that one. And it's like, yes, 1984, look at that movie. It was the year that launched a thousand franchises. Um, it, there's so many things. So anyway, so I Am Mark Sargent is a line, is a variation of a line that was in Fight Club. If you remember Fight Club and you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It's a really, really cool film. The uh, Where one of the guys, the... the the uh, anarchist dies and nobody knows his name and finally somebody says his name is Robert Paulson and it's like when you die you have a name because before then you were just a number you were just part of the machine 
the, the this anarchist group and it's like so it's we we're all we are all Robert Paulson I am Robert Paulson and so somebody kind of took the comparison it's like okay flat earth is kind of like fight club which I also mentioned in the in the clues which is uh, the first rule of uh, flat club is you don't talk about flat club the first rule yeah you don't talk about flat earth and anyway long story short somebody said oh well wouldn't that be kind of a clever thing I am Mark Sargent but if you've never seen Fight Club, which is now 25 years old, or, or if you don't know, the, you don't know it well. Even if you watched it once, you're probably not going to get the reference. So yeah, I am Mark Sargent, and people took this to be this big ego thing on my part, where I made up all these shirts saying I am Mark Sargent, and I just wore these. Nope. Nope, I didn't make up the shirts. I had nothing to do with the shirts. Uh, it was just a shirt where the director... I mean, it worked. At least people knew, I guess, what, who my name was, which was nice. Although, if you type in Mark Sargent, uh, uh, it generally comes... I mean, there's, there's a few Mark Sargents out there. Um, but I have people look up Flat Earth Mark whenever they want to look me up. Okay, there's Jaron and Jaron's eyebrows at the time. Uh, and he's at this canal. Okay, so he's setting up this laser test. This was the first laser test. You remember, this is a shoestring budget. He's at this canal, and he goes out there, and he had never gone out there. And so he goes out there late in the afternoon, and the sun's going down, and he didn't realize when he went out there that he didn't have line of sight when he when he first shot it. And so it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just do it live the first time. Well, and so we get all these people, and uh, there's his wife. And he goes out there, and beautiful shots, by the way, out this canal, and he didn't have, he didn't have freaking line of sight. And then, you know, the camera people were up there, and the, the, eventually the laser melts. You can tell the laser melts because the spread just gets bigger and bigger, and then finally just expands and explodes. And the, the, his whole idea was to shoot something at a distance and show that there's no curvature, you know, with, with the laser. <sighs> When it melted the first time, so there's two experiments, right? The first time was it, it melted and we, we, it was inconclusive. And, but where it got, where it pissed off the director, and again, the director went after Jaron harder than most people. Is a shoestring budget and we get to fly up my, my people from Los Angeles to San Francisco to shoot this. And so then uh, Jaron says, no, no, I got it this time. And he still didn't rehearse it. The, on the second time, he still didn't do it before Dan got there. So no, no, it'll work fine this time. We'll do it live a second time. A second experiment and uh, okay and I'll explain this as he's doing this because people want to know it's like oh Jaron didn't Jaron prove it didn't Bob prove it it's like no what happened was it was months later and I've said this a million times on, on different interviews what happened was Jaron goes out there finally during the day because people are asking it's like maybe you didn't have line of sight and he goes out there during a, a, a sunny afternoon and he he just with camera work and it's like oh we never were going to make it because we didn't have, it wasn't actually flat. It wasn't flat, even though Google Maps said it was flat. Well, you know, it's not perfectly flat. It's not like a salt flats or an, like an airport runway. It was flat-ish. And so that's what he went with. And so there was this moment. I remember watching the live stream when Jaron did. It's like, oh, my God. He goes, I didn't realize that I didn't have line of sight. It's like, oh, man. That's like, you've been doing this, you know, so, so I've been making excuses for him for a while. Now, did Jaron screw up? Yes, but he didn't screw up that bad. The, the only mistake he made, and it's a mistake we all make at one point or another. Yeah, see, that's when the, the whole condenser blew up. And now you can't get a beam because uh, the, 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 the lens had melted. The laser was, was powerful enough. Yeah, he, he bought a really nice laser, but the thing melted. Oh, Melissa. I don't think I've really talked to her that much. I'm glad she's actually mentioned my name in this. So anyway, so what happened was, and we'll again we'll get to the, we'll we'll kind of explain this as we're doing this. What happened was at the end of the movie, we'll we'll get I'll, I'll summarize before we get to that part of the movie, which is they brought them back, they brought up the film team for the second test. And like Jaron's like, damn it, I just blew out a laser that cost me some money. Uh, and when they brought them up for the second one, uh, they shot it, and the only way they could get the laser to show up is if they raised it. Well, that was because they didn't. Ha it wasn't flat, and so like, well, raising it, yeah, got got to compensate for the fact that it wasn't flat at the time. And by that, I mean the ground wasn't level. And what happened was, oh yeah, this is the the Raleigh, North Carolina, the the conference. By the way, uh, you know what? Let's just jump to the conference, and I'll explain the the other thing at the end. I'm not going to pause it. I'm just going straight through. So the conference, every, this is the big finale of the, uh, of, of the documentary. So this is also the last part we shot. That was the first time, by the way, I, I met David Weiss and, the, and his wife. Uh, David Weiss is not in the movie. He, he would have made it. Had he, and there's Nathan Thompson. 
every, we were all, everybody told not to dress up. Nathan Thompson put some sunglasses on a globe, and David Weiss wanted to kill him. There's Mac from Canada. Rest in peace, Mac. Um, so the conference was incredible, absolutely amazing. Nobody thought it was real. Everybody thought there's Chris Pontius bringing out his motorcycle. I was so happy he drove out there with his van to, to bring the motorcycle. Everyone was so excited. This is the first time most people had met. Uh, first time I met Robbie Davidson. First time I met Chris Pontius. First time I met so many people. And the media just freaking lost their minds. There's a guy that flew in from freaking New Zealand. Everybody's throwing uh, flat signs. There's Rob Skiba, rest in peace. There's Zulu. Hey, Zulu, what's going on, man? He's wearing the Eclipse shirt. There's Patricia talking to people. Women hated her because she was beautiful. Women hate women. They always do. Uh, uh, it, was a, it, was a great, it was a great event, but what was weird was when the media finally figured out that it was real, that what they do is they send out recon teams to, to the first day to see if it's real, and then all of a sudden all these film teams started showing up. Everybody was there, all the major networks. Uh, Howard Stern sent a team. Australian uh, media was there. French media was there. Uh, flew flew out as fast as they possibly. A lot of money was spent by mainstream to to get out there. We're looking over the the, the conference. Uh, Bob and Patricia are meeting for the first time. There's me, you know, coming in and saying hi. Hey, everybody, look me. It's my first placard, first lanyard that I ever I ever got for one of those events. I I don't think I still have that one. God, I gave away so much stuff. So uh, the FEIC again. That was Robbie Davidson. The, the conference, by the way, I was they were they were done by Robbie Davidson from Canada, and initially it was supposed to be co-sponsored by Brian Mullen from Balls Out Physics. And the Structural Engineer Association said, "We don't want you co-sponsoring this. Or we'll pull your license." And he got out of there. He, he had to lawyer up, and his lawyers said, "Yeah, we're you got to get out of this." And so Ro that Robbie Davidson completely took over. Uh, math, math Powerland, jealous. Oh God, envy is not a color you should wear, my man. He uh, he was really angry that he was not in the um, uh, not invited to the conference. I, why why would he be? He he was he was paying the ass. He was he was condemning us all the time. It was supposed to be his conference. It's my it's my movement, quote unquote. And he was late. He what he did was again you. You learn from your mistakes, which was, in his case, you don't play coy with the media. If the media wants to talk to you, you talk to them, unless you don't want to talk to them ever. You can't come back later and say, oh, no, no, I want to talk to you, you know, later. Yeah, when you get to be a diva, you know, when you get to be someone like Prince or Michael Jackson or Madonna or someone like that, yes, you can you can delay the media as long as you want. There's Robbie Davidson talking to me, saying, look, we got a bunch of seats in the back that uh, we're not, um, we're not, they're not going to be anyone in it because ODD told his people not to come to uh, to eat the money, to eat however, and these tickets were not cheap to, to go to this. And so Robbie Davidson, by the way, really tall. I'm, I'm 6'2", and Robbie was like 6'8", tall guy. And it was weird. All the speakers were... were Tall people. The only person I think that was under six foot, I think, was uh, uh, the host, <laughs> Rick Hummer. Rick Hummer is so wonderful, by the way. Um, love the fact that Matt was painted to be the villain. All, all great things. Uh, there's people filling in there. Uh, all, all, all great stories have a great villain, and Matt was a great villain for this. He absolutely was. It would have been better had they talked to him, I think. But honestly, it was. It turned out really well. Robbie Davidson. You know what? For a, it, we we gave him a lot of crap, and he's he's. Uh, not doing the conferences anymore. Currently, Karen B. is doing the conferences, which are called uh, Flat Flattoberfest. I think Robbie owns the rights to uh, Flat Earth International Conference, FEIC. Uh, but he did a pretty good job. Uh, it was Christian-leaning. He's a very strong Christian. And so I knew they did well because when we, we did the, the comment sections later, half of the people said it was too Christian. The other half said it wasn't Christian enough. And, so, and again, when you're the, the promoter, you can do whatever you want. It's your show. You pick the people that are going to be in there. Uh, there's all sorts of people that, that wanted to speak that, that weren't going to get the chance. And since it was our first one, we, uh, we got, to, uh, got to get a good lineup. Um, Chris Pontius, oh, showing off his wares. So fun. People were just mesmerized. It was just this, this wonderful corner of color over there where Chris was, had so much fun doing that. Jaron going up there. It was awesome. Jaron, Jaron, uh, you know, we're, we're working through our stuff. I think that was the first time Jaron had done a, a presentation. The only veteran that had done presentations up until that point was Rob Skiba. And Rob was, and a lot of people, the, the mainstream media stayed away from him because they, they said he was too churchy. You know, he had a chance to do the National Geographic special 
uh, he had a chance to do the, the Jane Polly thing. Patricia <laughs> taking it up a notch with her outfits. I mean, she... I love the fact that, like, for example, when we did the awards um, on the on the second night, that she wore a ball gown, and she didn't have to rent a ball gown. She already owned two full-blown formal ball gowns. And so there's me, a little nervous. I, I had done some public speaking for, for various training things over the years with, with software, but this was kind of my peer group. Rick Hummer, the most creative man I ever met, and uh, uh, a great, uh, great host guy is freaking all, all he is a hell of a showman daryl marble doing doing great stuff i know there's a little montage where people are, are thanking me for kind of waking them up to to the stuff even though you know i i wish that that guy never wore sleeves ever i suppose when you have arms that big because he was a, a shot putter an ex-shot putter from new zealand but he always wore tank tops i suppose if you got the gun show why not show him off right and i i got up there and, and said my thing but anyway rick hummer really really great uh Really excited to to do my first thing up there. It was it was humbling. Uh, and again, 2017, I had no idea what I was doing. My speech was very very simple, very very generic. I've kind of spiced it up since then. Kind of uh, uh, tried to add a little more lighthearted humor into it uh, because we've been doing it for a long time. And I mean, as of uh, what I'm saying right now, I've been doing this for over nine years. Next year will be the 10th anniversary of the Flat Earth Clues. And the Flat Earth Clues is what kind of spawned this, spawned this whole thing. Uh, you know, even though Matt Boylan was my inspiration, Matt had the chance to, it just worked out that way. In the beginning, there was Matt, there was Eric, and there was me. And uh, Matt turned out that he, be, he was a diva before his time, and Eric was this Zen voodoo Jedi master out of Thailand who, uh, for whatever reason, did not like sharing the stage with people. And it ever he had every chance. Even now, he could he could walk into a flat Earth conference, and there'd be a lot of people that would embrace him, and uh, and he didn't. So Eric again was was in, was absolutely. In fact, he endorsed this conference at one point, and then condemned it later. He uh, he just he said, "Oh, it was going to be a shill fest. It was nothing but government agents." Um, what I'd like to do, and I did this since since the very beginning, uh, because I just happen to be one of the things I've been good at over the years, even in my software training, is doing Q and A, which is having people ask ask questions. And that was, by the way, that was an I think that was an Australian journalist who I interviewed with later. Uh, oh yeah, that's the twelve year old kid that got us in trouble. The the twelve year old kid that that's why the we want to know the, why the the movie was the way it was. Is that twelve year old kid that was asking me questions? I couldn't even see him because of the house lights. And his parents brought him, and he and he didn't. They didn't weren't behind him. They didn't force him to ask, ask questions. And the producers and the directors is like, oh, okay, well now there's kids involved, so we got to take a stance. And they turned it from a human interest piece, and they slanted it against flat Earth, and it worked. It worked for uh, in our favor, because it made the audience feel more comfortable. It in no way looked like a propaganda piece, and so that's what what it what it turned out to be so yeah the 12 year old kid go figure i think it was the only kid that asked questions and then of course you know the science science people condemn everything it's like oh you know it's all fun and games until the kids are involved it's like yeah our, our demographic does skew older but that was at least until flat earth started propagating into uh the younger groups meaning um uh tiktok and instagram and um maybe. It is, it has now gotten to the point where there's kids, because there's so many kids. Remember, a third of the, the kids in the United States want to be social influencers for a career, which is never going to happen, of course. It's way too many. But they're all trying it, and they all need content. And because they're so young, they don't have any experience to make content. And because of that, they're stealing everything they can. And Flat Earth isn't copyrighted in any way, shape, or form. So they're grabbing Flat Earth content whenever they can because they know it's controversial. Uh, it's me interviewing with uh, Nightline. I don't think Eva is doing Nightline anymore, but uh, it's some interesting stuff. In fact, she interviewed Rob Skiba later. That was a fun interview. Again, you won't see Rob Skiba being interviewed in this because he was too churchy, even though he was our only veteran speaker. He'd been doing biblical pro prophecy for years on the circuit, and they wouldn't interview him because they didn't want him doing chapter and verse. They didn't want religion at any point tied to this show, and it wasn't. The, uh, so Eva interviewed Rob later, and he goes, I'll interview you, but I want my own camera people filming me just so when you shoot this out of context and when you edit this into whatever you want this to be, 
uh, you know, that, that I can do it. And yeah, 40 minutes she talked to him. They used six. And uh, I watched the 40 minute interview. And it, yeah, you want a clinic on clever editing. They didn't make them look bad, but they, they pick and choose. You know, they, they try, they look, they want you to get comfortable until you say something that's out of context or off character. Some, they're looking for the sound bite, the juicy sound bite. They want you to, they want you to be emotional. They want, they want drama. They want tears. They want passion. Uh, and sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. Uh, let's see here. We did little presentations. I can't remember what this one was about necessarily. Um, it was well done. You know, the audio actually and, and the video turned out pretty well for our first time. It, uh, after this conference, uh, after we did Raleigh, we did, oh yeah, Bob going up. So happy that Bob got to do that stuff. Um, uh, we did Denver the next year. After that, Robbie did Denver. And then that was the one I walked out of because Logan Paul showed up because Robbie took the money. Logan Paul paid him to, to show up at the event and, and get on stage. And it's like, okay, sure. And then Robbie kept that secret. I don't know how much money he made, but it was enough, enough that I walked out because I wasn't going to do a set because I knew who Logan Paul was. Because Le Logan Paul skews so young that uh, nobody knew who he was except for me. Uh, then Den uh, after Denver, we did Dallas uh, the year after that. So 2017 was Raleigh, 2018 was Denver, 2019 was Dallas. And then 2020, of course, was supposed to be Las Vegas. And um, by the way, they used, every time you see Scott Kelly in there, they used, I think, every frame of him because they only got to talk to him for 10 minutes. And uh, anyway, so um, 2020, we were supposed to be, do Las Vegas, and we couldn't do Las Vegas because of the mandates start rolling out uh, everybody knows the, the the famous story like patricia and i by the way we're going to actually do because she had the the financial backing she was absolutely going to do we were going to do vegas back in um uh, 2016 and people say oh no you're going to be all sell out and do a conference and, and it's like all right fine screw you guys and then what happens 2017 we do a full-blown conference so 2020 um was supposed to be Vegas, and the, what happened was, oh yeah, my glow in the glow in the tar, our, our neon bow tie that was battery powered in the collar. Um, we were supposed to do uh, Karen B took over, and then she ran conferences out of South Carolina because she found an event center. It was the Shriner Event Center in um, South Carolina that uh, would let us come come in without masks. In fact, the employees didn't wear masks. Nobody wore masks. And, you know, for the truther community, you're just not going to do it because there is a correlation. Just about everybody in the flat earth community didn't get the shot. And the ones that did were threatened with homelessness. And uh, so anyway, so, so Karen B took over and ran 20, 2020 up until now was all Flattoberfest. And she did it, took over and, and kept the fires burning during the mandates when nobody was doing conferences. So that was really, really awesome. A uh, little side story on the, the bow tie I was wearing, which will eventually be the glasses as well was I knew Patricia was going to wear a ball gown, which meant that everybody was going to be looking at Patricia's. It's kind of like the Academy Awards, right? Nobody looks at the guys. Everybody, like, what dress is she wearing? And so it's like, well, the only way I'm going to be able to match her at all is with technology. So I went on Amazon, and I just happened to run into it, and it's like it was a, it was a glasses and bow tie set that ran off the same battery, I think. And it was neon. It was this little tiny neon thing. And it's like, you know what? Considering how dark the room's going to be, I bet you that'll show up really, really nice. And so uh, the, the, they dressed me. I think it was Caroline Clark. She, you know, they, the, the, produce, the production team. It was the only time I would ever call it hair and makeup. There it is. The, the glasses. And that's the, movie, that's the poster, movie poster right there, where I was looking up at the elevator numbers uh, above the door uh, when we were going to I think we were coming or going there's Patricia in her ball gown again showing her in slow motion with the hair toss this is killing me really really but yeah uh, uh, bringing her out there you know she was uh, the the icon the best best looking guy in flat earth has got to be DJ from Los Angeles California but he wasn't around at the time uh, but the best looking woman in flat earth yep it was her every, every producer told me the same thing which was oh uh, yeah Patricia Steer uh, we were giving out awards. That was our first Flat Earth Awards show. There's David Weiss. Hey, look at David Weiss. Chris Pontius. Giving out awards to everybody. Uh, that was the, the Flatties. The, Chris Pontius designed the trophies himself, and it, they turned out really, really nice. And we and that became a thing. We gave it awards uh, um, in Denver, and we gave it awards in Dallas. Uh, in fact, uh, Karen B. and I were the, the ones that gave out the awards in Dallas. She's so great. Uh, it was awesome. And I wore, I wore the glasses then. I think I gave the glasses away to, oh, God. I can't remember who I gave the glasses away to after that one. We didn't do any awards after that during the pandemic. Uh, it was, I mean, we were lucky to, to get the conference going at all. And 
And plus, we weren't doing international conferences or anything like that. So we toned it down a bit. And then, uh, in, in fact, for Vegas, we may do awards in the future, but we probably won't do it. I mean, I really hope to, to get Chris Pontius back into it, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay, so this is Jaren's super scientific experiment. And this is the second one. They, the, two weeks later, they, remember, they had to come back to California for this. And they had to go back up to the Bay Area, up, up uh, near San Francisco, and shoot this again. There's Jaron, animated Jaron, which I really didn't notice until just now. And he's, he's getting ready to do the experiment again. Did not do it live, the, did not do any rehearsal, which is, again, rookie mistake, we all do it. Do a dry run. They call it a dry run for a reason. Every production you ever see, ever, I don't care what, what kind of show it is, it, they always do a dry run. I like the Academy Awards. For example, a great example. No, people's like, oh, they're just doing it live for us. No, no, everybody shows up and freaking goes out there and they, they do their stage marks and uh, they go through the lines. Everybody's everybody's done it. The only thing they don't announce for most of the people is the winners. Anyway, that was it. So that, that was it. The the, the 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 They cut to that. It was a really short segment. It's like, oh, wait, what is, what's it look like? Nobody understands. And they do the, uh, the, not necessarily outtake reels, but this is kind of like the bonus footage afterwards, which was Jaren's kind of explaining it. And we go through the, uh, the, the the different credits, the curvature test. We're still doing our stuff. I think one of the, the outtakes here was me announcing uh, the last part of my speech where I, I told people during the Q&A what I was accused of. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm a government agent. I'm a Hollywood exec. I'm blah, blah, blah. I rattled off the stuff. Got some pretty good laughs uh, in that. But what was interesting, again, while we're going through the credits, and we'll end this as soon as the, the, the movie ends, is that... Um, uh, people came up to me and they said, well, what happened at the end of that movie? So many people came up to me and said, what? and I go, what do you think happened at the end of that movie with Jaren and the Laser Experience? Well, it was bad, right? And it's like, really? Do you even know? Again, most people do not know what the laser experiment was even supposed to be. So there you go. I mean, it, it was, it, it, it worked and yet yeah, it didn't work. I mean, yeah, it got laughs at the end, but it was nervous laughter when I was in the studio audience. They didn't know what to make of it. And so I kind of had to explain it to him. But then again, a couple months later, after it came out on Netflix, uh, we, uh, uh, Jaron explained. It's like, yeah, by the way, we didn't have line of sight. So whatever. So anyway, thank you to everybody that, uh, that made the movie. It was, it was fun. Here we are years later. I'm going to put it with a giant watermark and low res on, um, on youtube and hopefully uh it doesn't it doesn't get hit with copyright you know honestly it probably won't even make it on youtube but we're going to make sure that people will be able to see it here and there hey and if you made the movie and you, and you want to again if you want to block it that's fine don't give me a copyright strike uh but because uh, I, I really think it'd be interesting for people to hear a little behind the scenes from a cast member so thank you everybody have a good one stay flat